Thanks for joining us for this symposium. I'm Bill Rapisi, President and CEO of the Lymphatic Education Research Network. Lauren's mission is to fight lymphatic diseases through education, research, and advocacy. In order to win a fight, you first have to join it. So we ask, please become a supporting member of LEARN at lymphaticnetwork.org. And we hope you enjoy today's symposium. Well, thanks for everyone for being here. And I just wanna thank the LEARN group for inviting me to come and speak to you all today. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Kelly Sturm. I am a physical therapist. I graduated about 10 years ago from the Mayo Clinic and I became a certified lymphedema therapist and LANA certified a couple of years later. And I'm also a board certified oncology clinical specialist. Today, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about exercise and lymphedema and specifically trying to answer the question, what kind of exercise is the most effective or the best exercise? Here are LEARN's, the support system that they have. You can see all the names there. And disclaimer, this information is, is just general information only. It's not specific to one individual. So if you have any other specific concerns for yourself, make sure that you speak to your healthcare provider for individual guidance. Here are my disclosures. I'm the owner of Cancer Rehab PT LLC, as well as an advisor for Aeros Medical. Couple of objectives we're gonna go through today, we're gonna to answer some of these questions. So we're gonna discuss what exercise can help prevent secondary lymphedema, try to help identify the best exercises for the prevention and management of lymphedema, and then also how to exercise with a flare up of lymphedema. So when I was given this topic of let's talk about exercise lymphedema, this is a hot topic. What are things that I should be talking about? And I really wasn't sure where to start. So what I did is I sent out a little questionnaire to my community on Instagram specifically and saying, what do you all want to know about exercise and lymphedema? What questions do you have? And I received over 150 questions in topics. So I couldn't talk about all of them today, but I tried to narrow it down to what are the ones that I was getting the most? What do people really want to know? So here are some of the things that we got a lot. What about prevention? What about safety? Are there things that we should avoid? And really what is the most effective or the best exercise? So we're gonna go through a couple different questions. The first one, are there exercises that can help prevent lymphedema? And this was specific for secondary lymphedema. So 20 years ago, we were taught as certified lymphedema therapists and also we taught all of the community members you know, that lifting more than 10 pounds or lifting anything heavy may cause lymphedema. So we, it was encouraged and discouraged to exercise. We encouraged just keep it light, don't overdo it, don't lift anything heavy. Thankfully, in the last 15 years, we have a lot of support with research that their groups are doing a wonderful job that have shown that weight training and exercise not only are safe, to do, but may also help reduce the risk of getting lymphedema. So we're gonna go a little bit into a couple of some of the research that's out right now. So this is a pretty well-known study. A lot of may have heard this before called the PAL trial. This really set a trajectory for us with this topic. And they had a study that had 295 participants, so specific to breast cancer survivors. So we are talking about secondary lymphedema. And they had an exercise program that had two times a week of progressive strength training. So they did this for an entire year. For the first three months, they were in a supervised setting with support from a professional. And then they were on their own or independent for nine months after. What kind of exercise was included with this? They had a 10 minute cardio warm up. They did stretching of large muscle groups. And then they did five to 10 minutes of core strength, nine strength training exercises with resistance, focusing on large muscle groups as well. And that was for whole body, not just upper body, and then stretching for a cool down. They had a specific protocol for upper body and for lower body when it came to that resistance or weight training. So for the upper body, they started with no weight or one pound weight. So really started really, really light and really low. 
there, if they had no changes in lymphedema symptoms that week that they were trained two times a week, no changes, no symptoms, then they increased that weight by a half to a pound, half a pound to a pound at a time. If there was any worsening of symptoms or someone had an increase in swelling, that then they took out the exercise that they thought might be causing that issue, or they got to a lighter weight until the symptoms cleared up and then they moved forward again. And they only went up to 10 pounds in the upper body. For the lower body, for strength training, they lifted the most weight they could eight to 10 times in each set of repetitions. And they built up to three sets. And after someone could lift the same amount, the same resistance for two sessions, the weight was increased by the smallest possible increment for the first three months when they were in supervised. And when someone was on their own and doing this independently, they increased the weight after four sessions. So every two weeks, they would add a little bit of weight. And what did this group find? So this is specific to breast cancer related lymphedema. After a year, 11% of the women who were in the weight lifting group experienced breast cancer related lymphedema. Well, 17% who were in the control group, meaning they were not participating in this, experienced breast cancer related lymphedema. But even more specific, if someone had five or more lymph nodes removed in their surgery, 7% of that group in the weightlifting group had lymphedema occur, while 22% for those who were not in the weightlifting group experienced breast cancer related lymphedema. What does this help show? So, exercise with slow progression or progressive resistance and weight allows for a gradual muscle and body adaptation. So when we think about this, if someone overdoes it or we jump into an exercise, we're really excited to get going and you get sore, or maybe you're out in the garden or you're out in the yard and you get sore the next day after doing so much, what is happening? To summarize it, there's inflammation going on to the muscles and it's it's not bad, it's not harmful. That's just how the body adapts to that much strain when it's not used to it. But what happens with that is we get more blood flow to the area, more inflammation to the area. And so we, if you think about with lymphedema, we wanna to try to avoid that. We don't wanna to try to put more fluid to the area than we, than we need to avoid a flare up. And so this shows that if we go really gradual with adding some weight, adding resistance, that it, it not only is safe to do, it doesn't add you know, risk of lymphedema. If anything, it lowers the risk of lymphedema. So this study, which is well known among others, so that not only is resistance training safe, but overall that is a good way to help try to prevent swelling and lymphedema, especially with those who had a higher number of lymph nodes removed. So moving on to lymphedema risk in the lower body. So again, talking about secondary lymphedema specifically, unfortunately, we still really don't have a lot of research at this time showing what are ways that we can help prevent lymphedema or lower the risk of getting lymphedema. There is a study done in 2021, very small, but they found that a tailored intervention of compression, which is known for supporting lymphedema, wearing that most days during the day, combined with exercise, trying to get 150 minutes, which is, think about it, it's 30 minutes, five days a week of moderate to vigorous exercise may help delay the onset of lymphedema. They did not talk about preventing it completely. They talked about delaying it. So those who were in the, um, in the control group, they was 3.2 months in the control and 8.8 months intervention when someone had an onset of lymphedema. So it delayed it, but unfortunately they didn't go in depth on talking about how to completely prevent it. And then talking about all other cancer types for secondary lymphedema, most of the research, which I know a lot of people understand this, is done with the breast cancer population right now. That's where a lot of the resources are. But a few studies support the same application that we just talked to to all cancer types. So talking about resistance training as well as aerobic training are really beneficial to help prevent and treat cancer-related lymphedema comparing to someone or comparing to no exercise. Supervised and unsupervised, so with a trainer, with a specialist, or also on our own can also be beneficial as well. So the next question, I used to be very active. Now I have lymphedema. What is the best exercise to do? 
There's not a lot of research specifically looking at this question. If there is a lot of research or if there is some research, it is still related to the secondary lymphedema, specifically the breast cancer related. But there are a few takeaways that we do know. Most importantly, there is no single exercise or activity that is best for everyone with lymphedema, but there may be a best kind for each individual. So everyone on this call, over 300 people are on this call, I can't sit here and say that every single one of you should be doing this specific exercise. Everyone should be doing swimming or everyone should be doing yoga. That's not necessarily true. However, for each person on this call, there may be a best exercise for you. And we are going to talk a little bit more about that. So there's just some factors that we want to talk about and Try to think about how this may relate to you or for the therapist on here, how this may relate to each individual that you work with. So supervised versus unsupervised. So with support versus on your own. So if someone is new to exercise, um, it's or they're trying a new exercise that they're not used to, or they have a new diagnosis of lymphedema, supervised exercise can be really beneficial for multiple reasons. One, we can help reduce the risk for injury. We want to make sure that we are allow, able, the professional trainer, whoever you're working with, can help give you feedback, give you cues to make sure that you have correct form so that you're not getting an injury. We want to make sure that you're consistent with exercise because that's where the benefit's going to be. And so if you have an appointment um, and you need to be there twice a week or once a week or whatever that may be, or you're going to a class that has a set time, you might be more likely to adhere to that schedule and be more consistent with your exercise as well. Like I said, we as therapists, as well as other professionals can help guide progressions to avoid flare up. We talked a little bit about that before early on that going really slow and um, progressing the exercise is really important to avoid that inflammation or um, any injury with that. So we can help guide that in a supervised setting. And we can also help watch for early detection uh, for lymphedema. If we're doing measurements, we're asking for feedback, we're doing, um, you know, day-to-day -day check ins with someone or week by week, seeing scaling back exercises or taking out movements that might be making someone feel a little achy or heavy. That's something that someone can do in a supervised setting. We're going to look at aerobic versus resistance training. So we just talked a lot about this. We're going to go a little more in depth. So specifically, resistance training programs, like we just talked about the PAL program, should be done slow and gradual with their progressions because that will help lower the incidence of lymphedema flare-ups and symptoms. Like I just described, we want to avoid getting too sore. We want to avoid a lot of inflammation to an area. Exercise is extremely beneficial, and we've already talked about that, but we don't want to overdo it all at once because that can cause a flare-up, cause more inflammation in an area. Resistance training can, be, can improve strength and muscle tone, which can be affected by fibrosis. I think this point is not talked about enough. And if you think about it, fibrosis or lymphedema fibrosis can really embed into tissue, can embed into muscle tissue. And when you have that embedded, and I kind of think it like a, like a spider web embedded into these fibers, then the muscle's not gonna contract the same. And over time, if it gets severe enough, you're not gonna have the same strength, you're not gonna have the same tone, and the ability to move around is not gonna be the same. And so by doing resistance training, can we optimize and really help out the muscles as much as possible to help minimize the effect that the fibrosis has on the body? And we know this for a fact, why do we give exercise for lymphedema management? This is something we do. Exercise is a component of CDT because the muscle contraction activation helps stimulate the lymphatic flow. The lymphatic vessels do not have a natural internal pump. So we really need the muscles around the lymph vessels to help activate, to help push the fluid through. And so movement contraction activation really is a major piece to lymphatic flow. When talking about cardiovascular or aerobic exercise, that can really help with um, lowering someone's BMI, body fat stores, or obesity. And why is this important? We know that obesity has shown to increase lymphedema risk with or without lymph node removal. And we are looking at here a BMI greater than 50 to 60. So a higher BMI can cause lymphatic dysfunction by itself. 
because of the damage it can cause on lymphatics and the pressure around the lymphatics. And unfortunately, even though someone may lose that weight to a normal BMI, after BMI gets that high, unfortunately, the lymphedema may be ir irreversible at that time. So just a really important reason to maintain weight management, um, maintain a healthy weight, and exercise is a great way to do that. Well, aerobic exercise and resistance training both can help with burning calories for weight management. And both as well. So both of them are beneficial for multiple reasons and they both can help encourage fl uh, fluid flow, lymphatic flow, and just an overall lymphatic or healthy lymphatic system. Another part of exercise that we have some research on is yoga. Um, I don't know if she's on here, but I know Babs um, was doing a uh, one of these talks earlier in the year. So I'm sure Learn has this on their in their website on their symposium list. Um, she's known for her lymphatic yoga, but there is a, a little bit of studies that shown that yoga is safe to do with lymphedema. It's possible to improve arm lymphedema or arm volume in the breast cancer population. It can help improve quality of life, improve range of motion, and improve pain and sensitivity levels. So there is a lot of benefit to yoga as well. So let's move on to what exercises should be avoided during a flare-up. So during a flare-up, one of the big things that I think is very important to do is continuing with exercise, but scaling. So when someone has a flare-up, and not everyone, but I do hear that someone will just take a break to, you know, stop what they're doing and, and not go back to it. You know, they were at a pool session and they had a flare up. And so, you know, they're not going back. It's really important, like we just talked about, to still have some sort of movement because we, the lymphatic vessels don't have that natural pump. It does rely on our muscles to help stimulate and activate around them to get the fluid moving. So if we have a flare up, we wanna make sure that we are trying to get the lymph flowing, but we will likely have to scale back or modify and maybe take some time and do really gentle movement to help with that flare up and also make sure that we don't make it worse. So there is a gray area there, but it is important to keep moving, just scaling back how intense or how much you're doing. It's really beneficial to wear compression during exercise. When we have that compression around the body, putting that external support on the limb or the area of the body, combined with that muscle pump on the inside, that's gonna give the most compression around the lymphatic vessels to help stimulate them and help encourage that lymphatic flow. And so again, I, during a flare up, find a way to gently keep moving in some way. If you can wear your compression during, that is the best. We do wanna avoid straining and overdoing it during this time or really any time, but it does happen, life happens um, because we are trying to avoid that inflammation we talked about. Think about muscle soreness, it, it happens. You, we can do something around the house and we have no idea that we are and the next day. You, you feel it, you wake up and like, ooh, I, I maybe overdid it. it it's going to happen. Um, that's gonna be more inflammation in the area and that can cause an increase in lymph volume. So we're not trying to do that. We're not purposely trying to do that. And so thinking about that when you are, I actually hear it a lot, painting the house or doing yard work, um, can you find a, a balance between that not overdoing it all at once? If someone during starts to get really feel heavy, um, have symptoms of their lymphedema flaring up, achy, um, really tired, that might be a cue to scale back um, or in the moment of an exercise, stop where you're at at that point. And then modify or scaling them we, to prevent injury, trauma, or overuse. We talked about the importance of modifying to avoid further flare up. We also don't wanna add injury or trauma. When someone has what we call an overuse injury, meaning you're doing something over and over, you actually can break down and damage and cause injury to tendons and muscles. Um, we don't want that to because that's gonna extend the inflammation process and that's gonna cause more fluid to the area and that's gonna be a little bit slower of a recovery. So high resistance, so meaning high weight, a lot of strain and high repetition can both cause worsening of the flare-up. Um, really combining the two is, is the biggest risk. So high repetition, maybe it's no weight, no resistance, but you're doing higher reps. To an extent, that's okay. We're really looking at really overdoing it, really maximizing how much you're doing in a day when you're really not used to it. That's what we, we look at for high rep. So if we're doing that, if we have any flare-up, 
Uh, again, I, I don't recommend stopping completely except for certain medical situations. There might be a reason in general and talk to your, your therapist, your doctor about that. But for some small flares up, I would just scale back, drop down to low and slow and starting low and then just gently progressing back into it. Switching over to safe exercise options. Gentle stretches and flexibility is a great option. You are getting the muscle activation, you're getting the muscle pump, you're helping to stimulate your lymphatics. So options, yoga, Tai Chi, anything in that area is wonderful. Strength and resistance training. We've talked a lot about that already so far in this half hour. Um, they're both extremely beneficial for lymphedema. Um, we just wanna be smart about it. So start with really low weight or no weight and then build up gradually. The study had a half of a pound to a pound adding on each week. And so you can see how slow we wanna build up. There's not necessarily a point that you need to stop and you're not able to lift higher than a, a you know, 20 pounds, 50 pounds. There's not a limit there, but as long as you're doing it gradually and you're listening to your body, um, that's really the important part. Aerobic exercise is safe. So starting with low impact is ideal. Again, to avoid overstraining. So walking, swimming, biking, whatever someone enjoys doing, that's a great place to start building up your time. So maybe it's starting with five minutes. Maybe it's going for a walk for 10 minutes. And each week you want to add a few minutes at a time or five minutes at a time. That's a smart way to start an exercise that can be really beneficial for lymphedema and then building up in a way that's going to at least minimize the risk of a flare up. High impact is also safe to do. We just wanna make sure that we're cleared by a healthcare provider for any other medical reasons or any other medical conditions. Again, building up. So rebounding, I know is popular. Someone likes running, that's fine. I know pickleball is getting really popular as well. Those are all safe to do. There's, I would say there's nothing that's not safe as long as it's not causing trauma. You're overstraining, overdoing it, and you're doing it in a way that you're allowing your body to adjust and gradually building up in the amount of time you do or in the intensity. So if you want to play pickleball, maybe go play for five, 10 minutes. And then the next week you can go 10, 15 minutes and you gradually build up there. Again, whatever someone enjoys doing, I don't think there's a limit to that. As long as there's no other concerns by your doctor, it's just how you build up. So more with safety, key things to take away when exercising, take breaks as needed. I like this. I know I have some people who love to just, they want to go for a walk for an hour straight. And I, and if you build up gradually and do that, and that works great. But I have some people who, it, you know, that, that always flares them up every time, no matter how much they gradually build up, they get to a certain point and it's just too much on them. So taking a break or splitting up an exercise. So going for 20, 30 minute walk in the morning and 20, 30 minute walk in the evening to get the same amount of time. The research shows that's still really beneficial to get the total amount of time, but maybe you need to take a break, split that up. And so that you can give your body a little time to, to breathe in, in between. Of course, stop if anything's painful for multiple reasons. We don't want trauma. We don't want injury. We don't want more inflammation to an area. And then get to know your body. I know a lot of you are very well tuned to your body or your patients are as well. So monitor for any changes. So you're trying something new. You're building up, looking for soreness, heaviness, fullness. If you need to scale back that week, maybe you can try moving forward again. Um, going nice and slow. If there's a certain movement or exercise that you feel like flared you up, maybe you just scale that one back for a week or so and then try it again. Just listen to your body or for therapists helping take measurements and monitoring for any changes. If there are any changes, talk to your therapist, talk to a doctor for any modifications or recommendations. I know like there's a lot of moving parts when it comes to managing lymphedema and, that, and each individual really, really has their own needs and their own um, needs for supporting for themselves. So that can get overwhelming and hopefully a therapist or your doctor can help giving recommendations to trial. It is a lot of trial and error. Avoid exercise if they cause an increase in pain or significant symptoms. Um, like I said, that's um, pretty straightforward. I like to say there's not something that someone can't try if they're doing it in a smart way, but there are some exercises for certain people that just seem to flare them up no matter how much they try that. And so we need to scale that, modify, or switch to that a different exercise. So another question I get is compression, should compression always be worn? So if able, yes, 
compression should be worn. It gives the most support to the lymphatic system. It's going to help more lymphatic fluid moving out of an area. It's going to be the best option. But in my opinion, when wouldn't you wear compression? If someone has a new or unmanaged infection or another medical issue or your healthcare provider, your doctor really encourages you to remove it for safety reasons, you would, of course, you know, not wear your compression during something like that. And the other one that I would say is if wearing compression limits someone from exercising, that would be a time to take compression off. Okay. So compression is always ideal. I know this can sound, you know, confusing for some people, but if the only exercise that feels good on your joints or that you enjoy doing that you can be consistent with is getting into a pool and wearing compression in a pool, I know some can do it or some do, um, but wearing a compression in the pool is a barrier to that. And you would take the compression off and you would do your exercise. Same thing. I know um, some of you are in, at a, in locations that are very, very hot right now. Um, if there is a medical reason that it's just getting too much, um, you know, but the exercise is going to be beneficial and safe in that situation, that might be a certain time that you could look at um, the benefit of exercise might outweigh taking the compression off. So what is the one best exercise for lymphedema? So that's the question I got the most, what's the most effective? What's the best exercise for arm lymphedema, for leg lymphedema, for trunk lymphedema? What is the best? And the answer to that is not straightforward. It's the one that a person enjoys doing and can stay consistent with. Like I said, every person in here is going to have a different type of exercise or multiple that are best for them. And that's not going to be the same for each person. We have talked about that aerobic exercise is beneficial. Strength training is beneficial. Yoga can be beneficial. Walking can be beneficial. Any movement can be beneficial as long as we're doing it in a smart way that we're gradually building into it to avoid flare-ups, to avoid overdoing it, to avoid injury. So someone might have to trial and error, but I think the first place to always look that I encourage is what does someone enjoy doing? Because if you don't enjoy it, like you're, you don't really enjoy going for walks, but you do enjoy the pool, then I'm not going to say walking is the best for you because if you only do it on occasion, it's not going to benefit you. You have to be consistent with it. If someone is, you know, concerned about this, at the end of the day, we want you moving there. Are so many benefits we're not even talking about today of exercise, not only for lymphedema, but for overall body, for overall health. So movement is going to be extremely important that you find something that you can be consistent with that is not strictly a barrier because of lymphedema. And so you'll have to try a couple of different things and you have to scale back and modify as you need to start low, start slow, but in, find something that you enjoy that you can stay consistent with. And that really is the most effective exercise for lymphedema. I have references here. And here. So um, like I said that we have time for questions. I see a lot in here. I'm going to try to get in. You can put them in the Q&A box. Um, I, you know, here's my website and my handle for Instagram or YouTube if someone's looking as well. But we're going to jump into Q&A here. So how soon after cancer surgery can one start exercising? Great question. So when anytime there's a surgery, whether it's for cancer or for anything else, you want to listen to your surgeon. The surgeon, each surgeon, each surgery have their own specific guidelines. So some are six weeks, some are 12 weeks. It's going to depend on the doctor. And once you are cleared, the goal would be to start nice, low and slow and gradually build up because there will still be some sort of inflammation likely happening after surgery. We want to, we do want to move. We want to exercise, but we want to start nice and slow. And a therapist can be really helpful to help guide someone there. Oh, I pushed that on. Okay figured out how to do it. Here we go. Has there been a trial for lung cancer survivors to prevent truncal swelling? I have personally not seen that um, at all. The only research I've seen is really just looking at the general population um, when it comes to secondary lymphedema and cancer, um, but not specific to lung cancer at this time. So how do we get access to the PAL trial? Um, I do have the reference on that last page. Uh, I think I just lost my group. I will try to make sure that we can, when you 
do the replay there, the reference section there, we can make sure that that's there. So there's the ability to look at that research study. Um, right. So how can you prevent lymphedema fibrosis? Uh, fibrosis is not something someone can always avoid completely, but to help minimize it is to try to keep the fluid as minimal as possible, keep the lymphedema low and well managed because if lymphedema sits in an area for a long period of time, that can increase fibrosis. So doing a nice job with managing lymphedema with compression and lymphatic drainage and the pumps and whatever we need to do to help keep um, fluid low in a limb that will help with uh, uh, preventing fibrosis, but also um, working on lymphatic drainage and hands-on techniques with a therapist can help really soften lymphatic or excuse me, soften fibrosis. And so can a lot of different garments um, and that will help with lymphatic flow. Do you recommend the use of compression stockings for exercise in both the prevention and treatment of lymphedema? That's a really good question. And it's actually a, a hot topic right now because there's some new uh, literature encouraging the more use of compression. And this has been done in breast cancer population specifically um, to wearing a sleeve to help prevent lymphedema. Um, compression that is uh, worn correctly, that fits correctly can be helpful. Um, the one risk is if, if the garment isn't fitting properly, that it, that you know that runs the risk of it causing a tourniquet or any other issues or damage to a certain area and that actually worsens the risk. So it's just smart to work with a therapist, someone local and to see what might be the best option. During yoga, how about static positions prolonged stays? Um, static positions are usually harmful for such patients. Sorry, I'm not sure on the question. I would say yoga in general is great. Prolonged positioning and yoga are not very long holds. Um, so you're still activating muscles. So I would think just general and yoga when they're in there, that's still gonna be a healthy exercise option. Should we wear compression sleeves in the pool? I hope this one was answered a little bit. I know some do, I don't think, Personally, I don't think it's necessary. I know each individual has their own reason. For every foot or 12 inches of water someone's in, it gives about 20 millimeters of mercury of pressure on a limb. And so if you think about that, that's a basic compression sleeve. So when someone's legs are in three feet of water, four feet of water it actually gives a really nice natural compression like a compression garment would. And so I think that's why pool is really beneficial along with the exercise. Um, same thing, another question about compression necessary during all exercise other than swimming um, as water provides compression. Exactly. And like I said, there might be a certain circumstance that someone is avoiding exercise because of garments. There's so many health benefits to exercise. There may be an occasion that wearing not wearing compression is okay, but it's strongly um, encouraged all other times. Recommending strength training six weeks versus eight weeks post-op. Again, that's really important that the surgeon makes that decision with you because each surgery is unique. Any specific brands or types of compression for exercise? Uh, no, not necessarily. Again, each garment is specific for that person. One garment, I would say the same thing does not fit every person in here. Um, there's a best garment for someone. I know it's trial and error. So whatever ends up working well for an individual is the best garment. Going through here, a lot of questions about the pool. Is a stationary bike okay like a Peloton? Peloton, absolutely. I think that's fantastic. It's a great way to exercise. And if you're in a hot area, Good way to stay cool when you exercise. Um, high impact exercise with or without compression. Um, ideally compression is worn with exercise. What exercise to continue with while on antibiotics for limb infection or cellulitis? If, a, if the doctor has cleared someone for exercise while they're on antibiotics, it would be any exercise that they were doing before. You probably have to scale back and start low and slow and gradually build up um, because the infection does flare up lymphedema at times. And we don't want to do that, but we want to gently move. So something nice and gentle. 
what type of strength and resistance training can you recommend for people who have lymphedema in the lower extremities? It's very hard to do exercise in with lower extremity. Yeah, they, their uh, light resistance training is is great option. If someone's not able to, I do like the pool. Walking's always wonderful. Biking's always wonderful. Or even the the cycle, um, blanking on the name. So it's the little steps that you can put on the ground and sit. Anything that's nice and easy for someone to do. Again, we want to make it easy so someone can be consistent is a, the best kind. In water exercise, does vertical, the vertical position, like walking, running, provide more benefit than horizontal and swimming? Oh, okay. I see what you mean. Um, not necessarily, no. If you think about it, we do talk about elevation at times. Um, in my opinion, elevation is a small factor in the management of lymphedema specifically. So at the end of the day, if someone enjoys walking and they're not fans of swimming, walking is the best way to go. If someone enjoys swimming, I would go that. I think that's more important than the position someone's in. Again, I would try to wear a compression when able. What about using compression machines? Um, compression pumps are great, uh, hard to exercise in them, but I think they work well together to help manage lymphedema. When doing exercise for lymphedema, is it correct to start from proximal then followed by the distal? So yes, this is what we traditional lymphatic exercise always spoke about is starting with the, the abdomen, the trunk, the hips, the inner, working out to the hands or the feet and then working our way back in because it follows that same pathway of lymphatic drainage. Um, that's a great option. Um, I would say though that if someone doesn't enjoy that, um, I would go a different route. I know that's what traditional lymphatic treatment or management has always talked about, but I think it's more important to get moving a little bit more, not being afraid to get out of just the basic movements. If someone is comfortable and wants to do more resistance training, work with a therapist, work with a, um, a specialist to help do that. I just think there's a lot of benefit to um, getting a little bit more movement and functional movement um, out of everyday um, basic movements. Uh, lots of comments about the hydrostatic pressure of water. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm running through, I got a lot of repeats. I'm just running through here. How many hours a day should you be active with stockings on? That matters that typically garments are worn 22, 23 hours a day for someone with lymphedema. And so I would still follow that. And activity guidelines, really a goal is 150 minutes a week of moderate to vigorous. So that's five days a week of 30 minutes. Um, but whatever someone is wearing for garments, you would do that anyway. A question about cording. Cording is a little out of this topic, so I will pass that one along. I have other resources on cording. Talk a lot about, let's see, Pilates. Oh, I love Pilates. Uh, Pilates is really hard. I think it's a fantastic core exercise movement. It's gentle on the body. I am a big fan of Pilates, absolutely. If a person is motivated and would equally enjoy performing any exercise, what type would be the most effective? Like we talked about there, they all have shown to be effective and beneficial resistance training, aerobic training. So I would find a combination because there's so many benefits to aerobic and helping with you know, heart health, as well as resistance training, helping with strength training. So having a combination is, in my opinion, what I would ideally go to if they really enjoy it and open to it. How helpful is rebounding for lymphedema? Uh, there are no specific studies on rebounding. Um, that are in depth specifically for lymphedema in the legs and the feet. It To me, it comes down to, again, does someone enjoy it? Um, is it a good workout? Is it safe to do? How much do you need to move each day? I think I'll just say this again because it's so important. A goal is to try 30 minutes a day, 20, 30 minutes a day, 150 minutes a week, some sort of movement, especially if someone has a desk job or is sitting a lot today. Can you get up and move a little bit every couple hours? Um, it's just really important overall for overall health. Some of my patients with leg lymphedema always worry about walking. What is your recommendation? Um, walking, if the worry is balanced, we definitely wanna make sure we're looking at safety. If someone is still concerned, even if they need to use an assistive device, I would switch to something seated or swimming, something safer, if that is what is the barrier. 
to getting out and moving. If walking is not the best for them, then I would just try a different option. It's something they, they're open to trying. Any tips for determining which specific exercise that is aggravating for a patient to be able to back off? It seems tricky when someone has a home program with multiple exercises, absolutely. And that can be really difficult. And so I usually will just start with what is the most straining, what has the highest resistance, scaling that back first. Or we can just, if we're really unsure, I would just take it all away and start with two or three simple exercises rather than 10 or 15, and then restart and gradually adding them back in. Every or individual exercises are the best for a patient. Um, sorry, I'm unsure on that question. Do you find that the treatment for primary lymphedema is different than secondary? If we're talking specifically about exercise, I do not. Uh, there's not a lot of research, unfortunately, for the primary lymphedema as far as exercise goes, but exercise is going to be really beneficial for everyone because of how much it supports the lymphatic system. I have a lot of questions on wearing and purchasing compression garments. Um, I would definitely reach out to a lymphedema therapist in your area because they can help find some support for you there. A lot of questions about primary lymphedema too. Like I said, I, I know um, there this was a lot of topics about secondary lymphedema. That's where a lot of this research is, but I would apply the same benefits to the various types of exercise, the different settings of exercise, um, the you know, walking, swimming, yoga, finding something that someone enjoys doing, gradually building up in the same way, monitoring for flare-ups, but scaling back for flare-ups as well. I would apply that in the same way for primary. Let's see, I'm trying to find the one we haven't talked about. What type of exercise is recommended for leg lymphedema when we have poor balance? So I, I reiterate this because I do think this is important. If balance is the biggest concern, we definitely want to make sure safety is involved. And so finding a seated type of exercise, possibly the, the pool, a swimming exercise, really a nice way to stay safe as well as still get the movement in. Would you explain how pressure in the water helps move lymph? Yes, so just to repeat again, for every foot or 12 inches of water in depth someone is in, or it puts about 20 millimeters of mercury of pressure on that area. So that's a, a basic compression sucking level. So multiple feet of water is going to give even more compression. That's gonna give support for the lymphatics as well as the movement and the muscle pumps gonna help with that as well. How many days a week would you recommend resistance training versus aerobic versus stretching? That's a great question. If I were to make a perfect plan that fits someone, I like to try to have aerobic three, three to five days a week and resistance training about twice a week and then stretching. If someone has time every day, it's wonderful. I know that's not realistic, but that would be great. Three to five days of aerobic, two days of resistance and daily stretching. Is there any benefits to open water swimming in cold conditions? I have no idea. <laughs> uh, the water's beneficial, uh, movement's beneficial. I don't know anything about specifically cold and open water. I uh, Secondary lymph lymphedema, mild joint hypermobility and mild injuries flared lymphedema. Um, speak on perhaps the other sources of injury besides overuse. Yeah, so any trauma, any injury to the body, say someone strained a muscle or broke, fractured a bone, anything that that's all going to cause inflammation to an area. Another surgery is going to cause inflammation to an area. That's the normal part of the healing process. Anytime we have inflammation to an area, there's going to be more blood flow. There's going to be more fluid. There's nothing we can do to avoid that. That's part of the healing process. And so there's a risk of lymphedema also increasing during that time. So we just do our best to manage it with compression gentle movement if it's safe, specifically from a surgery or injury, and getting back to kind of the basic CDT measure, measures for lymphedema management. Let's see, any insight on the cold plunging? I don't have anything specifically for lymphedema. I know there, that's a hot topic right now, but we don't have any, or I don't have any information specifically um, for that. Let's see, is the vibration plate considered a form of exercise? The vibration plate is still going to get a little movement, but really it's not going to 
pump and overactivate the muscles in the way I think is beneficial. It's not going to get blood flow in the same way. Um, it's not going to be the same for heart health and lung health. So I'd prefer still having some sort of exercise um, form. Any recommendations for compression exercise with arthritis and lymphedema? Yeah, arthritis can be challenging with or without lymphedema. Arthritis scaling would be, you know, the pool is a wonderful option for arthritis. Low impact exercise, yoga exercises, anything that's not high impact or a lot of pounding on the joints, um, that would, I would still do the same thing with lymphedema um, as I would with and without that arthritis too. What about golf? Well, I love golf. So I think golf's fantastic. Again, anything someone enjoys doing that's moving, uh, maybe 18 holes is a lot. If you're new, maybe go to the driving range for a little bit and build up, maybe make sure you use a cart. Um, so you're not walking along. It's just getting starting nice and slow and low and then building up. But if someone loves doing that. I think that's fantastic. Um, more about vibration plates. What are best for leg cramping when swelling is more than usual? Leg cramping is a great question. I get that one a lot as well. Leg cramping is often caused by a few things. Yes, dehydration can cause it, um, but tightness in the muscles can cause it. So I think it's really important to make sure stretching is incorporated every day to help with leg cramping and movement, but making sure that we scale back. So high repetition in a muscle group um, can cause it as well. So alternating movements more. And so you're not doing high repetition. It may be helpful as well. I'd love to know about the rebounding, the vibration plates, cold showers. Um, I do not know anything about the cold tubs, you guys, sorry. Anything specific to exercise for the groin area or pelvic genital lymphedema as well? Um, I, the same movements, we still wanna make sure we're doing core exercises and hip exercises, lower body exercises, breathing exercises, still movement is still gonna be beneficial, the whole body moving. Is cycling more effective than walking for reducing swelling? Not necessarily. Again, there's no research to say that any one exercise is best or better than another, but each person might have what fits best for them. What they enjoy doing is the biggest thing, but what feels good for them, what allows them to avoid flare up just and then be able to get out consistently and do the exercise. So not specifically more effective than another but might be best for one person. Okay, I apologize. I know there are a lot more questions. There's, we are not gonna have time to go through them all, but I think I had a lot of repeat topics. So hopefully I answered as many as I possibly could. Um, I just wanna thank Learn again for having me today and also putting on this free symposium. Um, there's been some really wonderful talks. They have other talks you can go back and watch, as well as a lot of wonderful resources. If you're looking for a lymphedema therapist in your area, they do have resources and directories on their website to get you to uh, the LANA page or other schools where you can search um, for a lymphedema therapist in your area. But I hope you all have a good day and, and good rest of your weekend. Thanks everyone for coming.